When I was in college, I was a bit of a mess, okay? And when I say a mess, I mean, like, when I was in college, I didn't know how to do anything. Now, growing up, my mom did everything for me. <laughs> she cooked, she cleaned my room, she folded my clothes, she did all my laundry. My mom did everything, all right? So this is my confession, all right? Hello, my name is Austin, and I was spoiled. Hey, Austin. Okay, so uh, just going to be completely honest with you guys. I like, didn't know how to do anything. When I went to college, I made a mean bowl of cereal, but that's it. And, um, you know, while I was in college, I actually went to college 12 hours away from home uh, in Lynchburg, Virginia at a college called Liberty. And while I was at Liberty, my parents dropped me off in my freshman year. I went, I didn't have any friends there. I didn't know anybody there. I just wanted to go to Liberty. And so my parents dropped me off 12 hours away from home. No friends, no family, nothing. They just dropped me off and said, you got it, you got it, dude. Way to go. You're in college now. And so I was dropped off. And so I didn't want to tell anybody, none of my friends, that I didn't know what I was doing, right? Because I, I didn't want to be that guy. Like, hey, bro, how do you wash clothes? You know, like, didn't want to be that guy. So I did what I thought was right, and I went to Walmart, Wally World, and I got uh, what I thought was laundry, uh, is, is it called laundry detergent? Yeah, okay. Wow, okay. Still don't know anything, okay. So I went and I got some laundry detergent. Come to find out, it was not laundry detergent. It was liquid fabric softener. Now, who knew that they even made this stuff, okay? So in my defense, why are they doing this to people, okay? Just like, why are you making Tide Pods look like good candy? Come on, people. Uh, and so the laundry detergent, I, it, was in, it ended up being uh, fabric softener. And so for the first semester of my freshman year in college, your boy went around smelling like a rose and actually having the cleanliness of a turd, okay? Like, I was not clean, but I smelt really, really good. Uh, and, and that happened, and then, you know, I had another incident happen with towels. Now, who here, like, you are of the mindset that you reuse towels more than once? Let me just see your hand, okay. Yeah, all the dirty folks, let's go, okay. So, so growing up, my mom, we didn't reuse towels. My mom was like, you, you, she's like the most southern woman you'll ever meet in your entire life she was like honey baby now listen when you clean your body and then your body gets all clean with a clean towel you dry with the clean towel now that towel is dirty i have no idea how it's dirty but she said it was dirty so we clean ourselves and then we would throw that towel into the dirty clothes now here uh when i got to college i was told hey man you're working too hard you don't you, you got to reuse your towels more than once and so i was like oh yeah man of course you know I do that. I know how to do that. And I'm, you know, I know how to do stuff. And so I started reusing my towels. My problem was that I went in and I thought, how am I going to reuse my towels in the most efficient way possible? I'm going to use a towel. And then when I get done with it so that I can have my towels for longer than all these other noobs, I'm going to use my towel and then I'm going to fold it up immediately. And then I'm going to put it on the bottom of the stack of towels at the top of my closet. Now, apparently that's not a good idea. <laughs> and my, my roommate, who was a senior, like, why are you still living on campus, bro? And he, he, was, he was telling me, he was like, man, he got so mad at me. He's like, Austin, you're going to make our room smell like mold. It's going to be mildewy in here. And as a freshman, you know everything, right? And I was like, no, man, you don't know. You don't know, man. It's going to be great. So I went to college. I was super unprepared. I didn't know anything about anything. And I went in with assumptions about stuff that ended up actually not being true. I thought that I knew how to wash clothes. I thought that I knew how to fold my towels and put my towels so that I would be able to use them longer. In reality, though, I was just plain dumb. Cracker Barrel people would call me ignoramus, right? I was just plain dumb. Now here's my question to you. Have you ever done stuff or have you ever believed something based on an assumption that just wasn't true? <laughs> we, we've all done that. We've all based some of our beliefs, we've all based some of our stuff on things that just weren't True, maybe it's something that you were told by a friend, maybe it's something you were told by a parent, maybe it's something you were told by a coworker. but you base some of your beliefs, I base some of my beliefs on, on precedents that maybe just aren't true. All of us, we got stuff in our life that is exactly like 
that. Like some of you, you believe every single year that the Dallas Cowboys are going to be good. And that's just not based in reality, Tyler. Like, bro, come on, get your life together, okay? And so what you do, because you love the Dallas Cowboys, you base your whole life around the Dallas Cowboys, and you think they're going to win, so you put them all on your fantasy team, and then your fantasy team ends up being terrible, and then you plan your Sundays around the Dallas Cowboys, and then you end up having Dak Prescott go down, right? And the Dallas Cowboys just aren't any good. Like, this happens every year. Or maybe some of you, like, you were born in Knoxville or you were born in Tennessee and you're not a UT fan. Like, what is your life, okay? Like, if you're born in Tennessee, you got to be a UT fan. Come on, somebody. (laughs) Somebody, boo, okay. I got security. Where are we? Okay. (laughs) See, some of us, we base things on things that aren't in reality. We base beliefs on that. And some of it's not really important like the Dallas Cowboys, but some of it is very, very important. And we just kind of gloss over it and we just kind of go with the flow and we just kind of go based on what we've been told to believe or we go based on what someone else said or we go based on what we learned in VBS instead of going to scripture and going back to what God says, many of us make assumptions about all kinds of beliefs in our life. And I believe today one of the biggest assumptions that we make in our life is the assumption about the afterlife. So many of us, we have beliefs on top of beliefs on top of beliefs about the afterlife, but many of us, we don't really know why we believe what we believe. We would just say, yeah, you know, like I was told one time that you go to heaven when you die, or, you know, I was told one time that good people go to heaven, bad people go to hell. I was told one time that like, if you're a medium person, you go to the medium place, you know, all you good place people out there, you spend a full Jeremy Baramy in the afterlife. And if you watch The Good Place, you get that. If you don't watch The Good Place, you have no idea what I'm talking about. But we base our our beliefs on things that just honestly aren't true. And the reason that I want to talk about the afterlife today is because I believe with all of my heart, I believe with everything in me, that what you believe about the afterlife can determine how you live in the before life. What you believe about the afterlife can determine how you live in the before life. And let me let you know a little something today that the before life is very, very important, but most of your eternity is going to be spent somewhere other than the before life. It's going to be spent somewhere other than planet Earth as we know it today. It's going to be spent somewhere else. And today, what we want to talk about is we want to talk about heaven. Heaven. We love heaven, don't we? We love heaven. Everybody wants to go to heaven. All dogs go to heaven, right? We want heaven. We love heaven. You know, you 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 have a cake and man, that tastes heavenly. You you have a conversation with somebody, you hear somebody sing, and man, your voice sounds like an angel. It's heavenly. We love heaven. Heaven. The problem, though, is that many of us don't really have a full belief system around the afterlife. We don't have a full belief system around what actually happens in heaven, who goes to heaven, where is heaven. And here's the reality. So many people today, we deal with anxiety, we deal with stress, we deal with problems of our life, we deal with depression. And and the reality is that most of us, the reason that happens, I'm not talking about clinical stuff. I'm talking about like the everyday that all of us have anxiety issues. All of us have stress that comes up in our life. The everyday stuff, it's because a lot of times we are so short-sighted to think that today is all that there is, that this life is all there is, when in reality, there's a home after this home. Heaven. Heaven. Heaven is a place that all of us want to have. All of us want to be. Our heart longs for heaven. Our heart wants heaven. It desires heaven. What you believe about the afterlife can determine how you live in your before life. See, Colossians chapter 3, the apostle Paul is talking to the the people in Colossae, and he's saying in Colossians chapter 3, listen, listen to me. This is what Paul is saying. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above 
where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Where Christ is, place your thoughts on things above, place your thoughts on heaven. Look at your neighbor and tell them, place your thoughts, go ahead, on heaven. Verse number two says, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Set your minds, set your sights, set your thinking, not on what's happening on earth, not on what you have right in front of you, but man, let's start setting our sights and our minds on heaven. Set it on heaven because, because listen, when we can start to learn to set our minds, our sights on heaven, it's going to start changing the way that we live here on earth. Set your sights on heaven. Now, there's a lot of places that I could start in, in talking about heaven. And there's a lot of places that we could go in talking about heaven. But I think what could be the most helpful for everyone here today is we're going to talk about three myths, okay? Three myths in the believers uh, and believing about heaven. Three myths. Three myths. So if you're taking notes, I want you to write these things down, okay? Pull out your phone, pull out a piece of paper, write it on your hand, write it on your neighbor's shoulder, whatever it takes, all right? Three myths that we believe very, very often about heaven. Myth number one, myth number one is simply this. Heaven is boring. Heaven is Boring. I'll be honest with you guys. I remember back in the day, I, I'm a, a pastor's kid, so I had to do all of the things that come with the church, all right? And it was super, super annoying. <laughs> Any pastor's kids, you know what I'm saying, okay? And, uh, and so I had to do children's choir. If you ha heard me sing the first week of our EXO series, you know I cannot sing. I had to do children's choir. I had to do Mother's Day Out. I had to do Sunday school. I had to do Sunday morning worship. I had to do Sunday night worship. I had to do Monday night visitation. I had to do Tuesday night prayer meeting. I had to do Wednesday night RAs. I had to do Thursday night because your daddy said go to the church. I had to do it all, okay? And uh, I'll be honest, growing up, heaven sounded boring. Can I be honest with you? Because it sounded to me like heaven was going to be like this eternity long, first, second, and fourth verse. I don't know where the third verse went. Always the fourth. First, second, and fourth verse of amazing grace forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And as a kid, man, that was boring. But can I let you know today, can I let you know today that heaven is not going to be boring. See, many of us, we have this thought because of you know, culture, we have this thought that when we die and if we get to heaven, however that happens, they're going to show up in heaven and that there's going to be, you know, it's going to be a, a giant worship service for all eternity and there's going to be fat flying babies just flying around all the time, all right? <laughs> now, let me let you know, if I go to sleep tonight and I don't wake up and I wake up in eternity and the first thing I see is a flying fat baby with wings and a halo... I'm going to think I'm in hell, okay? Like, that is not heaven, <laughs> all right? Like, that is not, I'm, I'm going to be asking God, God, what did I do, <laughs> you know? That's not heaven. We think that heaven is boring. Heaven is not monotonous. It's not boring. Heaven is four things I want to show today. There's, a, there's about a thousand things we can look in scripture and find, but I want to show you four today. I believe heaven, in heaven, you're going to know people. So for some of you, you lost your parents early in your life. You lost a child in your life. You lost a grandfather, a grandmother. You lost a brother, a sister, a wife, whoever it is. You're going to know those people in heaven. I think that we're going to recognize one another in heaven. You say, Austin, where do you get that? 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Paul says that for now we see uh, in, in part, but one day we will see in full. That once we get to heaven, man, we're going to know in full. We're going to be able to walk up to, to the saints of old. We're going to be able to walk up to our, our forefathers. We're going to be able to walk up to our parents that have gone before us. And we're going to recognize them. And we're going to be able to celebrate that, man, it's so good to see you again. Somebody get excited about knowing somebody in heaven. Heaven is not boring. Second is I believe heaven won't just be a cosmic retirement. <laughs> 
It's like you die and you go to heaven and at the gates, you know, Peter gives you a margarita and a lawn chair and there it is, baby. <laughs> heaven. <laughs> Sounds good. I can't wait to get to heaven, you know. That's not, that's not heaven. See, here's the reality is that in Genesis chapter 2, okay, Genesis chapter 2, this is before the fall. This is before sin entered. This is before Eve screwed it up for everybody, all right? Let's just be honest. Adam too, he was a part, okay? Uh, <laughs> but in Genesis chapter 2, I believe that it shows that in heaven that we're going to also have opportunities not just to worship, but I think we're going to have opportunities to work and serve Jesus, See, in Genesis chapter 2, before there was ever sin, the first thing that God did was God gave Adam a job. Did you know that work is not a bad thing? Work is not a bad thing, that work can be a good thing, that finding and fulfilling the purpose God has placed on your life by finding what you're passionate about and finding what you're gifted in and trying to figure out where those, are, those, those things intersect, your passions and your giftings, finding that sweet spot, man, that can be a game changer in your life. And I believe in heaven, we're going to be able to do that unto the Lord and serve Him in heaven. We're going to be able to serve in heaven, I believe, third, I believe we will worship in heaven. I believe we'll worship in heaven. See, right now, right now, Scripture teaches that the angels are surrounding the throne of God and that for day in and day out, for all eternity, they're saying, holy, holy, Holy is the Lord God Almighty, and they are showering him with praise. They are showering him with worship. And what we know, and what we talk about every single week here at Heart and Soul, is we know that angels have never experienced the grace of God. And if you've experienced the grace of God where you know what it's like to be lost, and then you know what it's like to be found. Anybody in the house, you know what it's like to be lost and be found. Man, we've experienced the grace of God how dare us as Christians, as believers, as people that have experienced Jesus Christ, how dare us let an angel out celebrate and out worship us. I believe when we get to heaven, we're going to cast our crowns at the feet of Jesus and we're going to worship him and we're going to praise him and we're going to say, God, thank you. It's not of works. It's not anything I could do. But God, thank you for saving my soul. It's all because of Jesus. I think in heaven we're going to worship. I think... Number four, in heaven, I think heaven will be more beautiful and perfect than anything that you or I have ever seen. It's to be more perfect than anything you've ever seen. If you look around our world, not just in the United States of America, if you look around our entire world, you know what you see pockets of all over the place? You see just pure evil. Pure evil. But in heaven, get this, in heaven, it is the very definition of perfection. It's going to be perfect. It's going to be beautiful. If you see the, the, the trees changing colors in the Smoky Mountains right now, man, anything that you've ever seen with your eyes, it's going to be double, triple, quadruple, squillions of times better in heaven than anything that we've ever experienced here on earth. There's going to be streets of gold. There's going to be walls of jasper. There, there's not going to be any lamps in heaven. You're not going to have to turn on a light switch because Jesus is going to be the light of the world and he's going to shine out and shimmer out and show us the light. Here's the amazing thing. I, I remember the old country preacher, man, the old country preacher, he used to say, Oh, well, here in America, <laughs> here in America, we worship gold and we walk all over God, somebody. But in heaven, we're going to worship God and walk all over gold. Come on, somebody. That's what we're going to do in heaven. We're going to worship God. We're going to see the beauty of heaven. So myth number one is that heaven is boring. Heaven, guess what? Is not boring. Heaven is going to be amazing. Myth number two, quickly, is that this world is your home. <laughs> this is a myth that we believe so often. We got mortgages built around it. <laughs> we got cars built around it. 
We got jobs built around it. We got families built around it. That this world is our home. And when this world ceases to exist, when we cease to exist on this world, that my home is now forgotten and then I'll just go float in the clouds with all the fat babies. But myth number two is that this world is not your home. That same country preacher, he used to say, eternity is too long to be wrong, praise God. It's true. Here, here, let me illustrate it this way. I saw a preacher do this one time. I want to change it up a little bit. But I want you to imagine that this rope, okay, this rope, I've got orange. Go Vols, come on. Yeah, come on. We didn't lose yesterday. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Love me some bye weeks with UT football. Okay, so this, this orange part of the rope is showing you, it's showing me all of human existence. Now, before it, we got all this rope here. This is showing all of the past eternity. Before earth was created, before all the stars were created, back way back in the day when it was just God. Try to put your head all around that, okay? This is eternity past. And then we got here, we got us, and then we got over here, we got eternity future. It'll last forever and ever 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 and it'll go forever. Now, what many of us do is we look at planet Earth right here, the orange, go Vols, come on. We look at the orange and we believe, man, this is my home. Now, if you look at this, all of human history, right here, you got Adam and Eve, right? Then you got, uh, you know, Eve messing up, Adam going along with it. And then you got Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You got Moses over here. You're just running through the Old Testament, right? Let's go ahead and fast forward a little bit. You got Jesus. Come on. You got Jesus in there. Stepping down into human history, that's great, right? Then you go a little bit further, you got 1776, America, baby, come on. You got America there, y'all don't like America? All right, cool. Uh, so, you got America, then you move a little bit further, Industrial Revolution, you move a little bit further. Let's just fast forward a lot to the 90s, baby. Who loved the 90s? All right, just me. Okay, so the 90s. And then uh, let's go a little bit further. Let's say that you were born right here. And then let's say that you're going to die right there. Hello. <laughs> you're going to die. <laughs> I actually looked up the stats, just so you know. One out of every one person does die. So you can either be mad about it or you can just say, hey, ain't nobody ever been wrong. I guess I'm going to die. Okay. So right here is where many of us look at our life and we say, this little sliver of life here on all of humanity, you can barely even see it from where you are, this little sliver, I'm going to live for this, and I'm going to die for this, I'm going to save up all of my money, I'm going to work my whole life until right about there, and then for the last 10 years of my life, I'm going to use all that money, and I'm going to live good. <laughs> and what we do is we take this part of our life and we live it as if, this part over here doesn't exist. Can I let you know that you are a, an eternal being? Can I let you know that this little portion of your life, this before life, is just peanuts, peanuts compared to where you're going to spend an eternity? So many of us, we live as if eternity is, our home, is not our home. We live as if this life is our home. But what Scripture teaches is that we are just passing through. That we're just passing through. That George Washington and Abraham Lincoln and Muhammad Ali and all of these great people before, that they passed through and now they are in eternity. All of us here, we will pass through this world. Get this, this world is not your home. And yet, many of us live our lives as if this is all there is. And, and what we do, I know what I do, is I live my life and I think, oh, I'm going to be late. Oh, man, I, I missed that. Oh, man, Tennessee lost another game. 
And I live as if this is all that matters when in reality, this, living for eternity, living for something greater, living for a God that's going to live with you forever, living for something that's going to help you to find Jesus is the greatest thing that we could ever live for. Second myth is that this is your home. See, what goes along with that is our understanding of heaven. We, we don't have a great understanding of heaven, I don't think, unfortunately. Uh, and I'll be honest with you guys, like I, when I was studying for this message, I'm telling you, like I learned so much stuff. The Bible is so cool. Come on. The Bible is so cool. And what we find from Scripture in Revelation chapter 21, it describes what heaven is going to be like, what your true home, if you know Jesus, is going to be like. It says this in Revelation chapter 21. This is John who was given a vision from Jesus. It said, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. Let's rewind for a second. Okay. A new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Now, we need to actually deal with that a little bit because what's happening right now is there, there is the, when the scripture talks about heaven, it's usually talking about three different things. The heavens, talking about the stars, the sky. The heavens, talking about like the solar system. And then the heavens, talking about like the eternity, okay? Now, what we believe and from what scripture teaches is that there is a heaven that is happening right now, right? And then when you die, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's what the Apostle Paul said. But we also believe that Jesus is going to return and he's going to resurrect us from the ground and we're going to have new bodies just like Jesus when he walked out of the tomb on the third day. He had a brand new resurrected body. We believe that one day we're going to have brand new resurrected body and Revelation chapter 21 teaches that Jesus will bring heaven on earth. That will be the new heaven. That will be the new Earth, it says, I saw a holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Behold, I am making everything new. I am making everything new. I, I, I know for a fact that there are people here today that last night you cried yourself to sleep. I, I know for a fact that this past month that there were people here today that you've lost loved ones and death has visited your family. I know for a fact that there's people here today that the internal pain that you're experiencing, the mourning, feels like more than you can bear. But can I let you know, can I let you know that this world, this world is not your home. That while weeping may last for the night, joy comes in the morning. And scripture says that heaven will be a place where there will be no crying. There will be no mourning. There will be no death. There will be no pain. For all the old things have passed away. Behold, all new things have come again. Your King Jesus will dwell the city right with you. And there will no longer be the things of this world. There will only be perfection. Somebody say amen to Jesus. Isn't that good? That's good news. That's good news. That's good news. This world is not your home. That's why I believe that what we believe about eternity can determine what we believe and live on planet Earth. Because when you know that this world is not your home, it changes your perspective on when you're late to that meeting. <laughs> it changes your, your perspective when something happens in your family. This world is not my home. This world has no hold on me. I belong to Jesus. Myth number three, the final myth today is, I think, probably the biggest myth that uh, we face. Myth number three is that good people go to heaven. Now, these myths are not based in what Austin Coleman prefers or what Austin Coleman likes or what heart and soul prefers or what heart and soul likes. These myths are based in 
Scripture. These myths are based in what we believe the Bible says. Now, if it was up to your boy, I would just say, can I just be really honest with you? If it was up to me, I'd be like, all y'all are getting into heaven, except for Hitler. He, gets, he stays out. He's not good, okay? And most of us would say, hey, good people go to heaven, but we don't base our life on the truth of this world. We base our life on the eternal truth of the word of God. Good people go to heaven is the myth number three. See, when we went out and uh, did our video, I don't know if you saw the video we did. We went to the mall. We went to UT's campus. We went downtown. We did a bunch of traveling, and we were asking people, hey, what do you think happens one minute after you die? What do you think happens in the afterlife? Do you think there's a heaven? Do you think there's a hell? And out of all the people we asked, there was a different answer for all the different people because in America, I don't know that we really know what we believe or why we believe it. I think most of us just think, hey, I'm going to live my life here today, and then once I get there, we'll handle it when we get there. And then I'll get in the line like the DMV. I'll get a, a card punch because I've been a pretty good person. I've never killed anybody. And if I did, they probably deserved it. Right? Like, most of us, we believe that good people go to heaven. So many of Americans believe this. In fact, the, the statistics say that 120 out of 121 people believe in America that they are going to heaven or to a better place after they die. 120 out of 121. And you know what? I sure hope. <laughs> I sure hope that that's true. But so many people believe good people go to heaven. Which begs the question, okay, if good people go to heaven, how good is good enough? How good is good enough? I mean, is it, you know, 50-50? Is it a pass-fail class? Like I show up and I get, uh, I get credit? You know, we, we look at it kind of like this, this ladder here. And many of us, we look at our works, we look at what we do, we look at how good we are, and we say, hey, you know what? I ain't never killed nobody. Bap. I've never abused anybody. Bap. I've never, you know, cussed out my coworker. Cussed out my wife, though, so let me back down a little bit. I, you know what? I gave a good tip to the waitress. <laughs> you know what? My boy that's on the corner, my homeless friend, I always stop and make sure I give him something. You know what? I have even been such a good person that I get involved with parent-teacher conferences, and those are the worst. Man, that's like the fourth level of hell, right? And so what we do is we, we start to climb up the stairway to heaven, and we think, if I'm good enough, then I'll have enough to when I roll up to the pearly gates... Old Peter, old Paul will say, well, you know what? You got that 50-50. We'll go ahead and let you in, brother. Some of us, though, we say, hey, you know what? It's not 50-50 because there could be some people that, you know, they really don't deserve heaven and they really don't deserve to be there. So we're not going to do pass-fail. We're going to do 75%. Man, just like you got past that class in college, come on. I got to pass my life and be just good enough to get through the gates. Then there's some of y'all, y'all were the people that asked questions when the teacher said, hey, uh, it's been a great day, we'll see you next week, and then you raised your hand and said, what about the homework? You guys say, hey, it's got to be 90%. If I'm 90% good, hey, you know what? I think I'm going to get into heaven. I think I'm going to make it. I think I'll be good. I think I'll do it. I think when I get there... It'll be amazing because I'll be able to see all the good things of heaven. I'll be able to see all of my loved ones in heaven. It's going to be amazing. Now, here's the problem. Is if we're really honest, that is just about the most unfair way to let people into heaven that there is. And you think, what do you mean unfair? It, it sounds fair to me. Well, what's the standard? Have you, ever, have you ever thought about this? If the question is how good is good enough, well... 
what's the answer? What's the standard? It's like if you went into a into your class, right? You went into a class for college and you rolled in and the professor looked at you and the professor said, all right, guys, we'll see you in three months. Uh, there's no syllabus. There's no books. We're going to give you a test in three months. You just need to come back. Be prepared for that test. There's no classes, no attendance. We'll see you in three months. Now, if we're really honest, that's really not a fair teacher because that teacher didn't tell you what the class is about. The teacher didn't tell you what books to read. The teacher didn't give you any study guides. There's nothing to base the standard of the class. Instead, he's just willy-nilly throwing it out there, and then you got to show back up. That's kind of how it is when we say, how good is good enough? That's kind of how it is when we have no standard of heaven. And we think good people go to heaven, People that are good at this or good at that go to heaven. And, and, you know, you as a Christian here today, you may not say that, but many of us think that and many of us believe in that direction. Now, if we look at what Jesus, what Jesus teaches... If we look at what Scripture teaches, what Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse 6, you may know this passage of Scripture, He said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through your works. No one comes to the Father except through your good deeds. No one comes to the Father except through you biting and clawing and climbing and doing your best to be your best. No one comes to the Father, not through those things, but no one comes to the Father but by me. Now, that's what Jesus says. And what Jesus has done for me and what Jesus has done for you and what Jesus has done for the entire world is Jesus has given us the best standard, the most fair standard that there ever was. Everybody is welcome. Everybody can come. Nobody is too far gone. Everybody can meet the requirement. No one is too bad, too bad to come. Everybody gets in the same exact way. And Jesus says that that way is through him. He's laid it out. It's, it's, honestly, if you really think about it and you deduct it logically, it's the most fair way. If you say, how good is good enough? Well, Jesus said that good enough is the wrong question because Jesus was always turning people on their head. What happened is the people of his day, they were asking the same questions. And the Pharisees were coming, and Jesus was saying, hey, these are whitewashed tombs, and they are not the way that you should go. In fact, he would tell people, even he would go a step even further. He would say, you know what? Be perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. <laughs> and you know what Jesus was setting up? He was setting us up for failure. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, be perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect. You know why Jesus told them that? You know why Jesus says that to us? Jesus says it to us. He said it to, to those back in the day because he wants us to see that it's not based on anything that we can do in our own strength. It's based entirely in what he did for us on the cross. It's not based on what I can do because I can guarantee you I am so much worse than, than any of you know. You are so much worse than you put on to the rest of the people. You know the deepest, darkest sins in your life. And guess what? This is the amazing part. You know those deepest, darkest sins? Guess who else knows? God. And you know what Jesus did? <laughs> Jesus knew those sins. He knew those mess-ups. He knows, knew those mistakes. And he still died for you. He knows you more deeply than anyone in this entire world ever could. And he loves you more deeply and intensely than anyone ever could. It's not based on what you do. Instead, it's based on who he is. See, it, it, it's totally, it's, it's really amazing because if it was based on works, get this, when we got to heaven, <laughs> if it was based on works, when we got to heaven, you know what I would be doing? I'd be walking through, I'd be strutting through those doors. i say, yo, Austin, way to go, big dog. You did it. You got to the good place. You were good enough. Way to go, Austin. 
You did it. You did it. You did it. I would be practicing pride in what would be perfection. That doesn't make sense. That doesn't work. Instead, instead, when we get to heaven, when you get to heaven, if you know Jesus, if you have a relationship with Jesus, when you get to heaven, we won't be patting ourselves on the back. We'll be praising Jesus because it's not anything you did, but it's everything that he did. That's what makes this so amazing. We think it's a stairway to heaven. And what I believe Philippians chapter 2, I'm going to read this to you, teaches, is that it's not a stairway to heaven, it's a stairway from heaven. It says this, Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider him did not consider equality with God something to be used on his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. All that means is that God put skin and bones on, and he came to earth. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by being obedient to death, not just any death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, 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 every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And every tongue will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I think this passage teaches us a couple things. I think it teaches us that whether you decide to give your life to Jesus today, once you get into eternity, whether you gave your life to Jesus and you show up in heaven ready to celebrate and ready to praise and ready to glorify God, I think if you decide not to give your life to Jesus and you find yourself one day in a very real place called hell, you will still be glorifying and praising and worshiping Jesus. What this also teaches us is that while we on planet Earth are trying to fight and crawl and bend over backwards to fight our way to get to heaven, God in Jesus met us. Instead of asking us to come up the ladder, asking us to come up the stairway to heaven, Jesus came down the stairway from heaven and he put skin and bones on and he said that it's not going to be my will, God, but it's going to be yours. And he said it is finished on the cross and he took on your sins and my sins, not just to make a show of it. He did it so that you and I could have new life so that before the new heavens and earth come, the old can be gone and the new can become. That we, can, that we don't have to live in what we are anymore. That we don't have to live in our anxiety. We don't have to live in our depression. We don't have to live in these states of mind anymore. That instead, we can push forward and we can trust in Jesus. And not based on what we do, but based on what He has done already. That He came down from heaven. That good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. Good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. Listen to me. I don't care what you've done in your life. If you are forgiven by Jesus Christ, I'll see you in heaven. The thief on the cross, he didn't have no time to be good. <laughs> he looked over at Jesus. He said, please remember me. And Jesus said, on this day, I will see you in paradise. Because good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. Church people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. Nice people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. Chick-fil-A people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. Good tip-leaving people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. Not based on what you do, but based on what Christ did on the cross. They died on the cross he took on your sin and mine he went into the tomb but three days later baby he walked up out of it and because of that you and I can experience forgiveness 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 what we believe about the afterlife can really determine and change how we live in the before life are you forgiven today? Because one day when you die, when you close your eyes for the last time, it's too late to make 
the decision. All we've got today, all we've got is this little sliver. And this is where we make the decision that impacts the forever of our eternity. Are you a forgiven person today? Not a good person. Are you a forgiven person? With every head bowed and every eye closed, 